The Dominant Idea. This a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dominant Idea by Voltairine de Clare. On everything that lives, if one looks searchingly, is lind the shadow line of an idea. An idea, dead or living, sometimes stronger when dead, with rigid, unswerving lines that mark the living embodiment, with the stern, immobile cast of the non-living. Daily we move among these unyielding shadows, less pierceable, more enduring than granite, with the blackness of ages in them, dominating living, changing bodies with dead, unchanging souls. And we meet also living souls dominating dying bodies, living ideas regnant over decay and death. Do not imagine that I speak of human life alone. The stamp of persistent or of shifting will is visible in the grass blade rooted in its clod of earth, as in the gossamer web of being that floats and swims far over our heads in the free world of air. Regnant ideas everywhere! Did you ever see a dead vine bloom? I have seen it. Last summer I trained some morning-glory vines up over a second-story balcony, and every day they blew and curled in the wind. Their white, purple-dashed faces winking at the sun, radiant with climbing life. Higher every day the green heads crept, carrying their train of spreading fans waving before the sun-seeking blossoms. Then all at once some mischance happened, some cut worm or some mischievous child tore one vine off below, the finest and most ambitious one, of course. In a few hours the leaves hung limp, the sappy stem wilted and began to wither. In a day it was dead. All but the top which still clung longingly to its support, with bright head lifted. I mourned a little for the buds that could never open now, and tied that proud vine whose work in the world was lost. But the next night there was a storm, a heavy driving storm, with beating rain and blinding lightning. I rose to watch the flashes, and lo, the wonder of the world! In the blackness of the midnight, in the fury of wind and rain, the dead vine had flowered. Five white, moon-faced blossoms blew gaily round the skeleton vine, shining back triumphant at the red lightning. I gazed at them in dumb wonder. Dear dead vine, whose will had been so strong to bloom, that in the hour of its sudden cut-off from the feeding earth, it sent the last sap to its blossoms, and not waiting for the morning, brought them forth in storm and flash as white night glories, which should have been the children of the sun. In the daylight we all came to look at the wonder, marveling much and saying, Surely these must be the last. But every day for three days the dead vine bloomed, and even a week after, when every leaf was dry and brown and so thin you could see through it, one last bud, dwarfed, weak, a very baby of a blossom, but still white and delicate, with five purple flecks like those on the live vine beside it, opened and waved at the stars and waited for the early sun. Over death and decay the dominant idea smiled. The vine was in the world to bloom, to bear white trumpet blossoms dashed with purple, and it held its will beyond death. Our modern teaching is that ideas are but attendant phenomena, impotent to determine the actions or relations of life, 
as the image in the glass which should say to the body it reflects, I shall shape thee. In truth we know that directly the body goes from before the mirror, the transient image is nothingness. But the real body has its being to live, and will live it, heedless of vanished phantoms of itself, in response to the ever-shifting pressure of things without it. It is thus that the so-called materialist conception of history, the modern socialists, and a positive majority of anarchists would have us look upon the world of ideas, shifting, unreal reflections having naught to do in the determination of man's life, but so many mirror appearances of certain material relations, wholly powerless to act upon the course of material things. Mind to them is in itself a blank mirror, though in fact never wholly blank, because always facing the reality of the material and bound to reflect some shadow. Today I am somebody, tomorrow somebody else, if the scenes have shifted. My ego is a gibbering phantom, pirouetting in the glass, gesticulating, transforming, hourly or momentarily, gleaming with the phosphor light of a deceptive unreality, melting like the mist upon the hills. Rocks, fields, woods, streams, houses, goods, flesh, bone, sinew. These are realities, with definite parts to play, with essential characters that abide under all changes. But my ego does not abide. It is manufactured afresh with every change of these. I think this unqualified determinism of the material is a great and lamentable error in our modern progressive movement, and while I believe it was a wholesome antidote to the long-continued blunder of middle-age theology, viz. that mind was an utterly irresponsible entity making laws of its own after the manner of an absolute emperor, without logic, sequence, or relation, ruler over matter, and its own supreme determinant, not excepting God, who was himself the same sort of a mind writ large. While I do believe that the modern reconception of materialism has done a wholesome thing in pricking the bubble of such conceit and restoring man and his soul to its place in nature, I nevertheless believe that to this also there is a limit, and that the absolute sway of matter is quite as mischievous an error as the unrelated nature of mind. Even that, in its direct action upon personal conduct, it has all the more ill effect of the two. For if the doctrine of free will has raised up fanatics and persecutors, who, assuming that men may be good under all conditions if they merely wish to be so, have sought to persuade other men's wills with threats, fines, imprisonments, torture, the spike, the wheel, the axe, the faggot, in order to make them good and save them against their obdurate wills, if the doctrine of spiritualism, the soul supreme, has done this, the doctrine of materialistic determinism has produced shifting, self-excusing, worthless, parasitic characters who are this now and that at some other time, and anything and nothing upon principle. My conditions have made me so. They cry, and there is no more to be said. Poor mirror ghosts! How could they help it? To be sure, the influence of such a character rarely reaches so far as that of the principled persecutor. But for every one of the latter, there are a hundred of these easy, doughy characters who will fit any baking tin, to whom determinist, self-excusing appeals. So the balance of evil between the two doctrines is about maintained. What we need is a true appraisement of the power and role of the idea. 
I do not think I am able to give such a true appraisement. I do not think that any one, even much greater intellects than mine, will be able to do it for a long time to come. But I am at least able to suggest it, to show its necessity, to give a rude approximation of it. And first, against the accepted formula of modern materialism, men are what circumstances make them. I set the opposing declaration. Circumstances are what men make them. And I contend that both these things are true up to the point where the combating powers are equalized, or one is overthrown. In other words, my conception of mind, or character, is not that it is a powerless reflection of a momentary condition of stuff and form, but an active modifying agent, reacting on its environment and transforming circumstances, sometimes slightly, sometimes greatly, sometimes, though not often, entirely. All over the kingdom of life, I have said, one may see dominant ideas working, if one but trains his eye to look for them and recognize them. In the human world there have been many dominant ideas. I cannot conceive that ever, at any time, the struggle of the body before dissolution can have been aught but agony. If the reasoning that insecurity of conditions, the expectation of suffering, are circumstances which make the soul of man uneasy, shrinking, timid, what answer will you give to the challenge of old Ragnar Lodbrog, to that triumphant death song hurled out, not by one cast to his death in the heat of battle, but under slow prison torture, bitten by serpents, and yet singing, The goddesses of death invite me away, now end I my song. The hours of my life are run out, I shall smile when I die. Nor can it be said that this is an exceptional instance, not to be accounted for by the usual operation of general law. For old King Lodbrog, the Scalder, did only what his fathers did, and his sons, and his friends, and his enemies. Through long generations, they set the force of a dominant idea, the idea of the superascendent ego against the force of torture and of death, ending life as they wish to end it, with a smile on their lips. But a few years ago, did we not read how the helpless Kaffirs, victimized by the English for the contumacy of the Boers, having been forced to dig the trenches wherein, for pleasant sport, they were to be shot, were lined up on the edge and seeing death facing them, began to chant barbaric strains of triumph, smiling as they fell. Let us admit that such exultant defiance was owing to ignorance, to primitive beliefs in gods and hereafters, but let us admit also that it shows the power of an idea dominant. Everywhere in the shells of dead societies, as in the shells of the sea slime, we shall see the force of purposive action, of intent within holding its purpose against obstacles without. I think there is no one in the world who can look upon the steadfast, far-staring face of an Egyptian carving, or read a description of Egypt's monuments, or gaze upon the mummied clay of its old dead men, without feeling that the dominant idea of that people in that age was to be enduring, and to work enduring things, with the immobility of their great still sky upon them, and the stare of the desert in them. One must feel that whatever other ideas animated them, and expressed themselves in their lives, this was the dominant idea. That which was must remain, no matter at what cost, even if it were to break the everlasting hills. An idea which made the live humanity beneath it, born and nurtured in the corns of caste, groan and writhe and gnaw its bandages, till in the fullness of time it passed away. 
and still the granite mould of it stares with empty eyes out across the world the stern old memory of the thing that was i think no one can look upon the marbles wherein greek genius wrought the figuring of its soul without feeling an apprehension that the things are going to leap and fly that in a moment one is like to be set upon by heroes with spears in their hands by serpents that will coil around him to be trodden by horses that may trample and flee to be smitten by these gods that have as little of the idea of stone in them as a dragonfly one instant poised upon a wind-swayed petal edge i think no one can look upon them without realizing at once that those figures came out of the boil of life they seem like rising bubbles about to float into the air but beneath them other bubbles rising and others and others there will be no end of it when one's eyes are upon one group one feels that behind one perhaps a figure is tiptoeing to seize the darts of the air and hurl them on one's head one must keep whirling to face the miracle that appears about to be wrought stone leaping and this though nearly every one is minus some of the glory the old greek wrought into it so long ago even the broken stumps of arms and legs live and the dominant idea is activity and the beauty and strength of it change swift ever circling change the making of things and the casting of them away as children cast away their toys not interested that these shall endure so that they themselves realize incessant activity full of creative power what matter if the creature perished so there was an endless procession of changing shapes in their schools their philosophies their dramas their poems till at last it wore itself to death and the marvel passed away from the world but still their marbles live to show what manner of thoughts dominated them and if we wish to know what master thought ruled the lives of men when the medieval period had had time to ripen it one has only at this day to stray into some quaint out-of-the-way english village where a strong old towered church yet stands in the midst of little strawed thatch cottages like a brooding mother hen surrounded by her chickens everywhere the greatening of god and the lessening of man the church so looming the home so little the search for the spirit for the enduring thing not the poor endurance of granite which in the ages crumbles but the eternal the eternal and contempt for the body which perishes manifest in studied uncleanliness in mortifications of the flesh as if the spirit should have spat its scorn upon it such was the dominant idea of that middle age which has been too much cursed by modernists for the men who built the castles and the cathedrals were men of mighty works though they made no books and though their souls spread crippled wings because of their very endeavors to soar too high the spirit of voluntary subordination for the accomplishment of a great work which proclaimed the aspiration of the common soul that was the spirit wrought into the cathedral stones and it is not wholly to be condemned in waking dream when the shadow shapes of world ideas swim before the vision one sees the middle-aged soul an ill-contorted half-formless thing with dragon wings and a great dark tense face strained sunward with blind eyes if we now look around us to see what idea dominates our own civilization i do not know that it is even as attractive as this piteous monster of the old darkness the relativity of things has altered man has risen and god has descended 
the modern village has better homes and less pretentious churches. Also, the conception of dirt and disease as much-sought afflictions, the patient's suffering of which is a meat offering to win God's pardon, has given place to the emphatic promulgation of cleanliness. We have public school nurses notifying parents that pediculosis capitis is a very contagious and unpleasant disease. We have cancer associations gathering up such cancers as have attached themselves to impecunious persons, and carefully experimenting with a view to cleaning them out of the human race. We have tuberculosis societies attempting the Herculean labor of clearing the Aegean stables of our modern factories of the deadly bacillus. And they have got as far as spittoons with water in them in some factories, and others, and others, and others, which, while not yet overwhelmingly successful in their avowed purposes, are evidence sufficient that humanity no longer seeks dirt as a means of grace. We laugh at those old superstitions and talk much about exact experimental knowledge. We endeavor to galvanize the Greek corpse and pretend that we enjoy physical culture. We dabble in many things. But the one great real idea of our age, not copied from any other, not pretended, not raised to life by any conjuration, is the much-making of things. Not the making of beautiful things, not the joy of spending living energy in creative work, rather the shameless, merciless driving and overdriving, wasting and draining of the last bit of energy, only to produce heaps and heaps of things. Things ugly, things harmful, things useless, and at best, largely unnecessary. To what end are they produced? Mostly, the producer does not know. Still less does he care, but he is possessed with the idea that he must do it. Everyone is doing it, and every year the making of things goes on more and faster. There are mountain ranges of things made and making, and still men go about desperately seeking to increase the list of created things, to start fresh heaps and to add to the existing heaps. And with what agony of body, under what stress and strain of danger and fear of danger, with what mutilations and maimings and lamings they struggle on, dashing themselves out against these rocks of wealth. Verily, if the vision of the medieval soul is painful in its blind staring and pathetic striving, grotesque in its senseless tortures. The soul of the modern is most amazing with its restless, nervous eyes, ever searching the corners of the universe, its restless, nervous hands, ever reaching and grasping for some useless toil. And certainly the presence of things in abundance, things empty and things vulgar and things absurd, as well as things convenient and useful, has produced the desire for the possession of things, the exaltation of the possession of things. Go through the business street of any city, where the tilted edges of the strata of things are exposed to gaze, and look at the faces of the people as they pass. Not at the hungry and smitten ones, who fringe the sidewalks and plain dolefully for alms, but at the crowd, and see what idea is written on their faces on those of the women, from the ladies of the horse-shows to the shop-girls out of the factory, there is a sickening vanity, a consciousness of their clothes, as of some jackdaw and borrowed feathers. Look for the pride and glory of the free, strong, beautiful body, lithe, moving, and powerful. You will not see it. You will see mincing steps, bodies tilted to show the cut of a skirt, simpering, smirking faces, with eyes cast about seeking admiration for the gigantic bow of ribbon in the overdressed hair. In the caustic words of an acquaintance to whom I once said, as we walked, look at the amount of vanity on all these women's faces. 
No. Look at the little bit of womanhood showing out of all that vanity. And on the faces of the men, coarseness, coarse desires for coarse things, and lots of them, the stamp is set so unmistakably that the wayfarer, though a fool, need not err therein. Even the frightful anxiety and restlessness begotten of the creation of all this is less distasteful than the abominable expression of lust for the things created. Such is the dominant idea of the Western world, at least in these our days. You may see it wherever you look, impressed plainly on things and on men, very like if you look in the glass, you will see it there. And if some archaeologist of a long future shall some day unbury the bones of our civilization, where ashes or flood shall have entombed it, he will see this frightful idea stamped on the factory walls he shall uncover, with their rows and rows of square light holes, their tons upon tons of toothed steel, grinning out of the skull of this our life, its acres of silk and velvet, its square miles of tinsel and shoddy. No glorious marbles of nymphs and fauns, whose dead images are yet so sweet that one might wish to kiss them still. No majestic figures of winged horses, with men's faces and lions' paws casting their colossal symbolism in a mighty spell forward upon time, as those old stone chimeras of Babylon yet do, but meaningless iron giants of wheels and teeth whose secret is forgotten, but whose business was to grind men tip and spit them out as housefuls of woven stuffs, bazaars of trash, where through other men might wade. The statues he shall find will bear no trace of mythic dream or mystic symbol. They will be statues of merchants and iron masters and militiamen, in tailored coats and pantaloons and proper hats and shoes. But the dominant idea of the age and land does not necessarily mean the dominant idea of any single life. I doubt not that in those long-gone days far away by the banks of the still Nile, in the abiding shadow of the pyramids, under the heavy burden of other men's stolidity, there went to and fro restless, active rebel souls who hated all that the ancient society stood for, and with burning hearts sought to overthrow it. I am sure that in the midst of all the agile Greek intellect created, there were those who went about with down-bent eyes, caring nothing for it all, seeking some higher revelation, willing to abandon the joys of life, so that they drew near to some distant, unknown perfection their fellows knew not of. I am certain that in the dark ages when most men prayed and cowered and beat and bruised themselves and sought afflictions, like that St. Teresa who still let me suffer or die, there were some, many, who looked on the world as a chance jest, who despised or pitied their ignorant comrades and tried to compel the answers of the universe to their questionings by the patient, quiet searching which came to be modern science. I am sure there were hundreds, thousands of them, of whom we have never heard. And now, today, though the society about us is dominated by thing-worship, and will stand so marked for all time, that is no reason any single soul should be. Because the one thing seemingly worth doing to my neighbor to all my neighbors, is to pursue dollars. That is no reason I should pursue dollars. Because my neighbors conceive they need an inordinate heap of carpets, furniture, clocks, china, glass, tapestries, mirrors, clothes, jewels, and servants to care for them. And detectives, too, keep an eye on servants, judges to try the thieves, and politicians to appoint the judges 
jails to punish the culprits, and wardens to watch in the jails, and tax collectors to gather support for the wardens, and fees for the tax collectors, and strong houses to hold the fees, so that none but the guardians thereof can make off with them. And therefore to keep this host of parasites, need other men to work for them and make the fees. Because my neighbors want all this, is that any reason I should devote myself to such a barren folly, and bow my neck to serve to keep up the gaudy show? Must we, because the middle age was dark and blind and brutal, throw away the one good thing it wrought into the fiber of man, that the inside of a human being was worth more than the outside, that to conceive a higher thing than oneself and live towards that is the only way of living worthily. The goal strived for should and must be a very different one, from that which led the medieval fanatics to despise the body and belabor it with hourly crucifixions. But one can recognize the claims and the importance of the body, without therefore sacrificing truth, honor, simplicity, and faith to the vulgar gods of body service, whose very decorations debase the thing they might be supposed to exalt. I have said before that the doctrine that men are nothing, and circumstances all, has been, and is, the bane of our modern social reform movements. Our youth, themselves animated by the spirit of the old teachers who believed in the supremacy of ideas, even in the very hour of throwing away that teaching, look with burning eyes to the social East and believe that wonders of revolution are soon to be accomplished. In their enthusiasm they foreread the gospel of circumstances to mean that very soon the pressure of material development must break down the social system. They give the rotten thing but a few years to last, and then they themselves shall witness the transformation, partake in its joys. The few years pass away, and nothing happens. Enthusiasm cools. Behold these same idealists, then, successful businessmen, professionals, property owners, money lenders, creeping into the social ranks they once despised, pitifully, contemptibly, at the skirts of some impecunious personage to whom they have lent money, or done some professional service gratis. Behold them lying, cheating, tricking, flattering, buying and selling themselves for any frippery, any cheap little pretense. The dominant social idea has seized them. Their lives are swallowed up in it. And when you ask the reason why, they tell you that circumstances compelled them so to do. If you quote their lies to them, they smile with calm complacency, assure you that when circumstances demand lies, lies are a great deal better than truth, that tricks are sometimes more effective than honest dealing, that flattering and duping do not matter if the end to be attained is desirable, and that under existing circumstances life is impossible without all this that it is going to be possible whenever circumstances have made truth-telling easier than lying. But till then a man must look out for himself, by all means. And so the cancer goes on rotting away the moral fiber, and the man becomes a lump, a squash, a piece of slippery slime taking all shapes and losing all shapes according to what particular hole or corner he wishes to glide into. A disgusting embodiment of the moral bankruptcy begotten by thing-worship. Had he been dominated by a less material conception of life, had his will not been rotted by the intellectual reasoning of it out of its existence, by its acceptance of its own nothingness, 
the unselfish aspirations of his earlier years would have grown and strengthened by exercise and habit, and his protest against the time might have been enduringly written and to some purpose. Will it be said that the Pilgrim Fathers did not hew out of the New England ice and granite the idea which gathered them together out of their scattered and obscure English villages, and drove them in their frail ships over the Atlantic in midwinter to cut their way against all opposing forces? Were they not common men, subject to the operation of common law? Will it be said that circumstances aided them? When death, disease, hunger, and cold had done their worst, not one of those remaining was willing by an easy lie to return to material comfort and the possibility of long days. Had our modern social revolutionists the vigorous and undaunted conception of their own powers that these had, our social movements would not be such pitiful abortions, core rotten even before the outward flecks appear. Give a labor leader a political job, and the system becomes all right. Laugh our enemies, and they point mockingly to Terence Powderly, acid his like. And they quote John Burns, who as soon as he went into Parliament declared, the time of the agitator is past, the time of the legislator has come. Let an anarchist marry an heiress, and the country is safe, they sneer, and they have the right to sneer. But would they have that right, could they have it, if our lives were not in the first instance dominated by more insistent desires than those we would fain have others think we hold most dear? It is the old story. Aim at the stars, and you may hit the top of the gatepost. But aim at the ground, and you will hit the ground. It is not supposed that any one will attain the full realization of what he purposes, even when those purposes do not involve united action with others. He will fall short. He will in some measure be overcome by contending or inert opposition but something he will attain if he continues to aim high. What, then, would I have, you ask? I would have men invest themselves with the dignity of an aim higher than the chase for wealth. Choose a thing to do in life outside the making of things, and keep it in mind. Not for a day, nor a year, but for a lifetime and then keep faith with themselves. Not be a light of love, today professing this and tomorrow that, and easily reading oneself out of both whenever it becomes convenient. Not advocating a thing today and tomorrow kissing its enemy's sleeve with that weak coward cry in the mouth, circumstances make me. Take a good look into yourself, and if you love things, and the power and the plenitude of things, better than you love your own dignity, human dignity. Oh, say so, say so. Say it to yourself and abide by it. But do not blow hot and cold in one breath. Do not try to be a social reformer and a respected possessor of things at the same time. Do not preach the straight and narrow way while going joyously upon the wide one. Preach the wide one, or do not preach at all. But do not fool yourself by saying you would like to help usher in a free society, but you cannot sacrifice an armchair for it. Say honestly, I love armchairs better than free men, and pursue them because I choose, not because circumstances make me. I love hats, large, large hats with many feathers and great bows, and I would rather have those hats than trouble myself about social dreams that will never be accomplished in my day. The world worships hats, and I wish to worship with them. But if you choose the liberty and pride and strength of the single soul, and the free fraternization of men, 
as the purpose which your life is to make manifest, then do not sell it for tinsel. Think that your soul is strong and will hold its way, and slowly, through bitter struggle perhaps, the strength will grow, and the foregoing of possessions for which others barter the last possibility of freedom will become easy. At the end of life you may close your eyes, saying, I have not been dominated by the dominant idea of my age. I have chosen mine own allegiance and served it. I have proved by a lifetime that there is that in man which saves him from the absolute tyranny of circumstance, which in the end conquers and remolds circumstance, the immortal fire of individual will, which is the salvation of the future. Let us have men, men who will say a word to their souls and keep it, keep it not when it is easy, but keep it when it is hard, Keep it when the storm roars and there is a white-streaked sky and blue thunder before, and one's eyes are blinded and one's ears deafened with the war of opposing things. And keep it under the long leaden sky and the gray dreariness that never lifts. Hold unto the last. That is what it means to have a dominant idea, which circumstance cannot break and such men make and unmake circumstance. End of the Dominant Idea Recording by Rhonda Fetterman